Once again, what a joy it is to be here today to worship with brothers and sisters in Christ. I want to remind you to take a card from the pew back in front of you and fill that out so that we can have a record of your attendance. Guests, uh, that is your offering uh, when the plate comes by. So, uh, One other item that I'd like to remind you of, here in a, a week or two, another house-to-house, heart-to-heart mailing will be going out. This is a very special issue, and because it is a special issue, we have paid for that uh, particular issue to go into every home in Bourbon County. So be looking for that, and when it comes in the mail, use it as an opportunity to talk to your neighbors about what's going on here at the Parish Church of Christ and about the truth for which we stand. Today is the final lesson in our series on minor New Testament figures. We've been studying these individuals now for the last several weeks. And next Sunday, we'll begin our study of the book of Numbers. And I hope you're looking forward to that as I am. But as we conclude, we thought this morning about a young man named Jude, the brother of Jesus Christ. And though we might call him a latecomer to the faith, ultimately Jude stands as a defender of the faith that we have in Jesus Christ and his brief letter that he writes is full of power and it exhorts believers to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And that phrase right there is a very powerful phrase. And what I'd like for us to do this morning is to look at this phrase a little bit more in depth. And we're going to do so by starting at the end of it and working our way to the beginning. And so first of all, we're going to consider the idea that the faith was once for all delivered. And then we'll look at what that faith is. And then finally, we'll talk for a few minutes about contending for it. And so first of all, we see that the faith was once for all delivered. And what does this mean? Well, we've got to think for a moment about the idea of revelation. Revelation is the idea that God has spoken to man. And when we think about revelation, we actually think about two different kinds of revelation. One is what we call general revelation. God has spoken to us. He speaks to us continually even today through his creation. Paul argues in Romans chapter 1 that even those who were not of the people of God in times past understood that God existed because they saw the creation around them. And so in that sense, revelation will not cease so long as we live in this physical place. We will know that God exists because there is order in the creation around us. Now that's what we call general revelation. But usually when we talk about the idea of revelation or of truth being revealed to man, we're talking about special revelation. And it is by special revelation that God speaks to his people in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. It is by special revelation that we have this book we call the Bible. Men who receive special revelation, like Moses, wrote the first five books of our Bible. But as we move from the Old Testament period to the New Testament period, there's a time in which special revelation ceased, what we call uh, prophetic silence for 400 years, from the end of your Old Testament to the beginning of your New Testament. And when that special revelation resumed, there were certain promises that were made concerning it. Jesus was teaching, uh, he had been given the Holy Spirit when he was baptized, and he was teaching the people, and especially his apostles, about the things that were to come, about the kingdom that he was going to establish. And he promises his disciples in John chapter 14 that when he goes away, that is after his death, burial, and resurrection, he will ascend, and following that event, that they will receive a special anointing of the Holy Spirit. And he makes this promise in John chapter 14, verses 25 and 26. He says, These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now Jesus is promising to his apostles special revelation. And we know that this promise is specifically for his apostles because of the way that he words it. He says that the Helper will come, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. He will teach you all things, and we're going to see some of those things in a few moments. But he also says, he will bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. 
Now that means this promise that is made is made only to those who walked with Jesus. It was a very special promise. And we're going to see that promise fulfilled in the book of Acts. Because when we turn to Acts chapter 2, the apostles have come together in chapter 1. By a divinely led process, they have replaced Judas Iscariot with another apostle named Matthias. And in Acts chapter 2, in the beginning verses of that chapter, verses 1 through 3, we see that the apostles are anointed by the Holy Spirit with fire. A sound like a mighty rushing wind comes about and the tongues of fire appear over their heads and they're given this special gift that Jesus had promised to them in John chapter 14. And the result of this special gift are some wondrous things. They begin to speak in tongues and to do things that they'd never been able to do before. And it creates quite a scene. So much that an opportunity is opened for Peter to preach the gospel for the very first time to those who are gathered. And so in chapter 2 of Acts, verses 14 through 36, he gives this great sermon in which he affirms that Jesus is the Son of the living God, the Christ, the Messiah of the Old Testament Scripture, and that all of these things that are taking place on this occasion have been planned and promised by God in the Old Testament. And at the end of this great sermon... We can see the response of the people in verses 37 through 41. Having heard the message of Jesus Christ, they repent and they're baptized because they believe that message. And what I want us to notice is the comment that uh, Luke, led by the Holy Spirit, gives us in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. Following this sermon, following this anointing of the Holy Spirit, and following the response of the people, this is what we read. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, in fact, it was not, strictly speaking, the apostles' teaching. It was the Holy Spirit's teaching. But because the apostles had been given this special gift by God, this special revelation... They were carrying the message of Jesus Christ, one that had never been heard before in the way that it was being presented, demonstrating that Jesus was, in fact, the fulfillment of the old promises made in the old covenant, showing that he was indeed the Christ who was prophesied. And it's described as the apostles' teaching because it is only the apostles with this special gift that are able to proclaim this at first. Now what's going to happen is those who learn it from them are going to be able to share it. And in fact, we find that in our New Testament. But here's something we need to understand and remember. That you will not find any divinely given prophecy in the New Testament that adds to or takes away from the basic message that Peter preached in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 11, you'll find prophecy about a famine that's coming into Jerusalem. That prophecy does not change anything concerning the message that Peter preached in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 20, Agabus comes to the house of Philip and he prophesies that the apostle Paul is going to be bound in chains. And that prophecy is a true prophecy. It does, in fact, take place. But that prophecy said nothing to change, alter, add to, or take away from the basic message of the gospel that was first preached in Acts chapter 2. All of the sermons that we read recorded in the book of Acts are some variation of the basic message that Peter preached in Acts chapter 2. Now the book of Revelation, written by the Apostle John, has a number of prophecies within it that are related in some fashion to the gospel. But none of those prophecies alter the basic truth of the gospel that was revealed in Acts chapter 2. Now all of that to say that the Apostle's teaching can be summed up and what we find in Acts chapter 2. And the writings that we find in the New Testament all in some way address the way that we live that out. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. But we need to understand that once this basic message was given in complete form, then the special gift of prophecy was going to pass away. You can turn to the book of 1 Corinthians and we can find that this is borne out in the text there. Now we know that the church in Corinth had a number of problems. They were divided over a number of issues. And one of their divisions was about miraculous gifts. 
We can read in 1 Corinthians and see that a number of different miraculous gifts were present in that congregation. From the ability to heal, from the ability to speak in tongues, from the ability to interpret those tongues, the gift of prayer, the gift of faith, and the gift of prophecy. And Paul makes it very clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7 that all of those gifts were given for the purpose of building up the congregation. For the common good, Paul says. And so the early church in its infancy needed these gifts because this was, a, this was an infant church just beginning. And so these gifts were needed to build it up. And we know from Scripture that the miracles were given to confirm the word. But we also know from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that these gifts which were given to build up the infant church were never intended to be permanent gifts here on earth. This is what Paul says to the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 9 and 10. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Partial knowledge, partial prophecy, those things will pass away. When the Holy Spirit has given the complete truth, that's what perfect means, the completed truth, when he has given that truth, then these partial gifts will pass away. And you're holding in your hands, many of you this morning, what we believe is that completed truth. The New Testament bears the full truth of the gospel from beginning to end. And so once the New Testament was completed, then the need for special revelation ceased. Because we have the special revelation recorded for all ages right here. And so Jude says, you contend for the faith which was once for all delivered. It was delivered once for all. It's complete. It's not going to change. You can't change it. It is ageless. And because it has been delivered once for all, special revelation has ceased. So what is this faith that he's talking about? Jude says, contend for the faith once for all delivered. Now we can notice right away that the way that Jude says this lets us know that there is only one faith. He says the faith. He doesn't say the faiths. But we need to define faith so that we understand what he's talking about. Because when we speak of faith, we could be speaking abstractly of the idea of faith. In other words, I believe, therefore I have faith. That would be what we would call the subjective use of faith. But we can also speak of the objective use of faith. When we say, my belief is blah, blah, blah. Now that's what Jude is saying here. Your belief, your core teaching. He says you contend for the core teaching, the faith, which was once for all delivered. Now we just saw on the previous point what that faith is. It is the message of the gospel. And we need to be clear that the gospel is not simply the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But before I get ahead of myself, let's look at an exam another example of this use in Acts chapter 6 and verse 7. In Acts chapter 6 and verse 7, we read this. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Now what that means is this teaching, this faith, this one teaching, is something that calls upon us to obey. It is a teaching not simply about facts, or figures, but is a teaching that calls men and women to obey it. And the teaching that was delivered first on Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 was in fact a gospel message that called men and women to obey it. Now we can find Paul describing the faith also as the gospel in Galatians chapter 1 beginning in verse 6. In Galatians 1 beginning in verse 6. Now if you look at the end of this chapter in verse 23, we will see, He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith. And we're going to back up now to verses 6 through 9 where we see that the faith is synonymous with the gospel. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, 
If anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Now what we understand is that there is one teaching. There is one solid, unchanging teaching that came through the apostles. It is called the faith. It is called the gospel. It calls men to obey it. And when we say gospel, we may often think of 1 Corinthians 15 and say the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's true. But it's also true that the gospel is living the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's how we obey it. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7. We obey the gospel. Just like the priest in Acts chapter 6 obeyed the faith. And how do we do that? Well, Paul describes in Galatians a number of different places the way that we live out the gospel. In Galatians 2 and verse 20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. In Galatians 4, he talks about being put into Christ through baptism. He talks about in chapter 5, cultivating the fruit of the Spirit. In that way, we live the gospel. We live the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But I don't think we have a clearer place of this teaching than in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. In Romans chapter 6, Paul is addressing a very similar issue to the one that Jude is writing about in his short letter that we call Jude. Jude is writing about the fact that there are those who are teaching another faith. They're teaching another gospel. They're teaching a sensual gospel. A gospel that allows man to fall into sensuality or lewdness. And Paul addresses a very similar thing here in Romans chapter 6. Beginning in verse 1, he says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? By no means. And he goes on to say that we have participated in the gospel. He says, for as many of us as have, died, have been buried with Christ in baptism have died with him. And he goes on to talk about how we've died to sin and how we've been raised to a new life in God through Jesus Christ. And so the gospel, being the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, is something we live in our conversion. When, just like those men and women in Acts chapter 2, heard, believed, repented, and were baptized, they obeyed the gospel, we do the same in our conversion. And then following that, we continue to live the crucified life that Paul talks about in Galatians chapter 2. Now this is the one teaching and I don't know about you, but this is not a teaching that I hear everywhere today. There are many who reject this teaching. And according to Jude, according to Paul, they are not following the faith. They're teaching another gospel. If we do not teach the essentiality of these things, that it is necessary to hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and live dead to sin and alive to God, we are not proclaiming the gospel. For this is the one teaching that came first on Pentecost through the Apostle Peter and continued to be supported by apostolic teaching throughout the New Testament period. There is only one. There cannot be more than one because the New Testament consistently speaks of one gospel, of one faith, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. That's verse 5. And so if there's one teaching and special revelation has ceased then we must contend, Jude says, for this teaching. We must stand up for it. We must be willing to fight for the truth in which we believe. Now, Jude is not writing to apostles or preachers. He's writing to all Christians when he says, contend for the faith once for all delivered. And so he's telling all Christians to fight for the truth. Now in Philippians 1 and verse 16, Paul says that he is imprisoned for the defense of the gospel. And it's certainly true that these early apostles and preachers often laid their lives on the line in order to defend the gospel. And it's certainly true that we expect that the apostles in the New Testament, even the preachers and evangelists in the New Testament, were zealous and they were able to answer any number of questions, perhaps, concerning the faith. They had that special gift of the Holy Spirit, and we don't have it today. But Jude is not telling us that we have to be able to answer every possible question that arises concerning what we believe. But he, like Peter, believes that we should be ready always to give an answer for the reason of the hope that is within us, 1 Peter 3 and verse 15. What does that mean? That means that as Christians, I'm speaking to the Christians in the room, we need to know and understand the gospel message. 
We need to know how we came to hope in Jesus Christ. We need to know what he did to save us from our sins. And believing that basic message and obeying it, we need to be able to explain it to anyone who would ask us about it. And Jude says, if someone teaches something other than the truth of the gospel, we should be able to defend against it. That doesn't mean we have to be able to debate uh, every person who comes along with every possible question concerning the New Testament or the belief that we have. Not everyone is able to stand up on a public stage and debate with an atheist concerning the existence of God. I'm thankful for my brothers and sisters in Christ who are able to do just that. Not everyone is able to stand up here as I am this morning. But we should all be able to give an answer for the reason for the hope that is within us. To be able to describe what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did for us when He died upon that cross, when He died to pay the penalty for our sins, and how we have died with Him in the waters of baptism, crucifying the sins of the flesh, rising to walk a new life. Every one of us needs to be able to fight for that truth. And we do so with the sword of the Spirit in our hands. Paul describes this fight in Ephesians chapter 6. In Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 10, he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Now the fight that Paul describes is not a fight that we undertake alone. We don't go looking for battles, but we are prepared to stand against the evil one. And what Paul tells us here is that when we fight for the truth of the gospel, we are not fighting against flesh and blood. We're not fighting against men and women. It's not that we have a bone to pick with our denominational friends or neighbors. It's not that we think that they're anything less than we are. It's that we understand that there is truth and we must stand for that truth. And when we stand for the truth of the gospel, Paul says, we are not fighting against flesh and blood, but in fact we're fighting against the forces of evil. When we study God's word, when with God's word in hand, we proclaim the basic teaching of the gospel to our neighbors and friends, we are sending the devil on the run. We're putting him in high gear. We're fighting against the spiritual powers, Paul says. And Jude says we've got to stand and fight for the truth, for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. March 8. March 8, 1971. Two heavyweight champions of the world come to contend for the ultimate title heavyweight world champion. In the late 1960s, Muhammad Ali was called upon by the United States to participate in the Vietnam conflict. And because he refused to go to war for the United States, because he refused to be a part of the United States military, he was stripped of his heavyweight title. In the intervening years between that time and 1971, Joe Frazier came along and won several fights and was awarded the title of heavyweight champion of the world. And so on this fateful night in March 8, 1971, both of these men held the title of heavyweight champion of the world. Neither one of them had ever been defeated in a professional, professional fight. And Ali was known for his quickness and his dexterity. He was known for taking out his opponents early on, knocking them out in the early rounds of the fight. But Frazier was known for his longevity. He was known for what the boxing world calls going the distance, fighting the full regulation time of a fight, going every round until the last bell ring. And he was known for these body shots that he would continue to throw, especially his left hook that he would continue to throw over and over until the last bell. And so he often won by decision. So on this fateful night, 
1971, Joe Frazier and Ali come together for what would be the first of three very well-known fights. And it's the first time in history that Muhammad Ali loses a professional fight. And he lost because Joe Frazier was a contender who was willing to go the distance. And when Jude says, contend for the faith once for all delivered, he's saying, you go the distance. You don't give up. You fight for the truth until the last bell rings. Paul says, I have finished my course. I have fought the good fight. Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Jude says, you fight. You contend until the last bell rings. And the title will be yours because of your faith in Jesus Christ. That's the message that it gives even to us today in Jude verse 3. And maybe this morning, you're already a Christian and you want to give up. Jude says contend. Contend for the faith once for all delivered. The faith will not leave you. It will never change. It's been delivered once for all. Contend for that faith. Don't give up. And if you're not yet a Christian, you have an opportunity through Jesus Christ to be part of this battle on what we know is the winning side. To know that at the end of this life there is something more waiting for us. An imperishable inheritance, Peter calls it in 1 Peter chapter 1. So the Lord invites you this morning, whether you're already a Christian or you'd like to become one, to respond to his invitation as we stand and as we sing together.